uh, what we did last time, we considered a random matrix, a square random matrix with IID entries, which are centered and of unit variance and say bounded, although it's not needed. And uh, we were proving the bound for the smallest singular value. So for any epsilon, the probability that the smallest singular value is bounded by epsilon over square root of n is bounded by this sum. This is an inequality and a good inequality should tell a story. It should point out to some qualitative phenomenon. And this one does. So what does it tell us? If I cover the second term, this is the behavior of the smallest singular value of a Gaussian matrix. And the difference is this uh, constant term independent of epsilon. And this is the probability that, for example, a random Bernoulli matrix is, uh, is singular. So uh, it is singular with probability two to the negative and at least, so it should break down at the exponentially small level. So what this theorem claims is that every random matrix behaves, uh, the, sing the small singular value of every random matrix behaves like that for the Gaussian matrix until it suffers breakdown as the Bernoulli ma uh, random matrix. And we essentially proved this theorem. So what we did, we uh, proved that uh, we can reduce the bound for the smallest singular value to the bound on the inner product of uh, the first column of the matrix and the unit vector U, which is orthogonal to all other columns. Well, and uh, then we need to analyze this quantity with the idea that we want to show that this is bounded by C epsilon. And it quickly uh, becomes clear that this small ball probability depends on the direction of u. And so let's separate the set of uh, uh, bad directions. And bad means that I cannot get this. So I wrote that m is going to be the set of all vectors u for which the opposite inequality holds for some epsilon. So our task as we formulated at the, towards the end of the lecture was to characterize this exceptional set M and after a, suffi a, a sufficiently understandable characterization is obtained, we can recall that U is orthogonal the columns start uh, from two to n, and we want to prove that the probability that this random normal falls into the bad set is exponentially small. If we uh, do it, then I can write that this is the same thing. And U is not in M plus the exponentially small error. But U is not in M means that we have the opposite inequality for all epsilon. So this is less or equal than C epsilon plus E to the negative CN and we are done with proving this theorem if we can realize this program. 
And let me again recall that this result is uh, universal. It, uh, it, uh, it holds for all, basically for all random matrices. Okay, so we, uh, we are down to this program. So how to characterize them? First of all, what I have here is the inner product of one column, which is random and the normal, which is also random, but the randomness is different. This U depends only on columns from two to N, which means that it's independent of A1. So to characterize it, I'll, uh, I'll consider a constant vector U and see how this behaves for the constant vector. And let's, let me denote A1 to be the vector X1, et cetera, Xn. These are coordinates. And then the inner product A1 U is the sum of U J X J. A linear combination of IID random variables X J. And we have to analyze this small ball probability for it. Uh, if we deal with the linear combination of independent random variables, then of course a tool of choice would be the characteristic function. Uh, y of t is uh, the expectation of e to the i y t. Because uh, the characteristic function of the sum of independent random variables is the product of characteristic functions. It's very easy to analyze. And the small ball probability is also amenable to uh, uh, work uh, with characteristic functions. Namely, there is essence lemma, which tells us that the probability that a random variable y is less than epsilon is bounded above by constant times epsilon times the integral from negative one over epsilon to one over epsilon of the absolute value of the characteristic function. Now, this is uh, rather easy and this is actually the uncertainty principle. So what is the probability that y is less or equal than epsilon? It's the expectation of the indicator of negative epsilon, epsilon of y. Now, the indicator is, uh, uh, so the support of the indicator is negative epsilon, epsilon. If you consider the Fourier transform, by uncertainty principle, the Fourier transform will be concentrated in the interval negative one over epsilon, one over epsilon. And this is a formalization of, of that intuitive idea. Well, if I know this, then my task is to analyze the product, uh, the characteristic function of uh, the linear combination. And uh, let me consider one particular case. Let x1, et cetera, xn be symmetric Bernoulli one half random variables. So they take values plus and minus one with probability one half. Then the characteristic function of Bernoulli is the cosine function. So if I call this y, then the y of t is going to be the product of uh, cosine of a j, uh, sorry, of u j t. Okay, and 
uh, we are interested in the absolute value of this object. So this is the absolute value of the product of the cosines. How does it behave? Cosine is between negative one and one. We multiply a lot of these cosines and uh, the product is very small unless almost all cosines are close to one. So if this characteristic function is not negligible, if it's greater than something, it means that almost all these cosines are either a negative one and one, which means that uh, 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 this, uh, uh, these products are close to, uh, to the integer lattice times, uh, uh, times pi uh, and uh, right, right, the integer lattice times pi. Okay, so we have some, uh, some kind of a resonance effect. If I, uh, uh, this can be non-negligible only if there is such, uh, such T that if I multiply it all coordinates by T, I get close to an integer point. It took time actually to formalize it and to produce a criterion characterizing M, but it turns out that what governs this closeness to the integer points is just the usual Euclidean distance. So the bad points are the points such that if you consider the vector u and you multiply it by t, this vector passes close to the integer point in the Euclidean distance. Okay, so this is the characterization and uh, uh, then we'll have to uh, say that the probability that u belongs to this set is small. First of all, the, uh, we have to make a small adjustment to it because we start from the origin and so we automatically pass close to the integer point. Actually, there is a separate argument which allows us to exclude the region around the origin. So these points close to the origin are going to be irrelevant. And then the set of all bad points is uh, the set of all bad directions is the set of all u such that if I draw this line, it passes through one of the red balls. U is actually the, uh, sorry, M is actually a subset of the sphere. So I have to project this picture back to the sphere. Now let's see what we have. Uh, these balls are rather small, so they occupy a tiny portion of the space, actually the exponentially small portion of the space. If I project it back to the sphere, the projection will occupy an exponentially small portion of the sphere. Uh, and of this, can be used to claim that the set M, the set of this exceptional set has a very small epsilon net. Actually the epsilon net can be read from this picture. We can use these centers and their projections back to the sphere. 
radial projections back to the sphere. So the epsilon net for M is exponentially small and changing the radii of those balls, I can change the base of the exponent. Very well, then, then we are done with, with one, we need two. And again, let's formalize this condition. U is orthogonal to A2, et cetera, A N. This means that yeah. no, I am sorry. Uh, uh, I, I, I don't want to get into uh, the question which epsilon I'll choose for epsilon net. This is a, a yeah, it, it's not this epsilon. No, it, it's a different one. And uh, selecting it is a, is a long story. No, uh, because first of all, uh, I don't consider the whole space. My integral was from negative one over epsilon to one over epsilon. So uh, this, I only consider the ball of radius one over epsilon. No, uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, it's a delta net. Uh, this delta. It's a half an hour story. Uh, actually, the delta is not related to epsilon. It is related. It's going to be related to the uh, to this constant C. Okay, so we found uh, out that we have a very small delta net, and now we want to show that a random normal almost certainly misses this bad set M. So how could I do it? Again, let's formalize this condition, if I write A, the matrix A1, A2, et cetera, A, and these are the columns, and I call this part the matrix B. So B is uh, N by N minus one matrix, and then, the fact that u is orthogonal to these columns means that b transposed u is zero. And we want to show that uh, this b transposed u is zero uh, occurs with a very small probability if u is in the bad set. But that we have our epsilon net argument, which we prepared last time. And uh, if you remember where uh, this argument misses the target by an exponential factor, C to the N. But here we, we can compensate for this exponential factor because we chose a net, which is much smaller than what we used before the volumetric estimate and cardinality of n delta is three over delta to the power n. We managed to beat it by the exponentially, by the exponential factor from C of delta to the power n where a C of delta is a constant depending on this radius and I can make it arbitrarily small. And then uh, this takes care of uh, the second step in our program.
Any questions? Okay. As I said, the, the theorem is universal. This is its strength. And at the same time, it's, uh, it's also a weakness. If you want the precise estimate for the singularity probability and the singularity probability is obtained taking epsilon equal to zero, then we are at loss, this, uh, this constant is universal. So if we consider Bernoulli matrices, we need something different. And the study of singularity of Bernoulli matrices uh, goes back at least 70 years. Uh, but the breakthrough was uh, uh, achieved only oh, three years ago by Tikhomirov. And let me formulate his theorem. So let AIJ be Bernoulli one half, and A is uh, the square matrix then the probability that the smallest singular value of a is less than epsilon over square root of n is less or equal than c epsilon plus one half plus o small of one to the n. And this is the, uh, the best one can hope for, because uh, as we said, the probability that the first row equals the second one is two to the n. Okay, so uh, the new information is only in the probability of singularity in epsilon equals zero. So why did I formulate it this way? The proof is via geometric method, and uh, when you do it by, geometrically, you're actually get it as a free byproduct. And later, using Tikhomirov's method, Jane, Sa, and Sony Uh, prove that uh, even a more amazing result that if we consider Bernoulli random matrices, but P Bernoulli with P strictly less than one half, then the probability that is uh, the smallest singular value is less than epsilon over square root of n is less than c epsilon plus one minus p to the n and plus q to the n and q is strictly less than one minus p. So what does it say? Uh, uh, in this theorem, it doesn't matter. In this theorem, it's zero one. It doesn't have mean zero. It doesn't have mean zero. This is a technical point, but it's a very easy technical point. Uh, it it requires some ten lines in the proof to take care of non-zero mean. Okay, so what is this right hand side? Let's say that epsilon is zero. Then this is the probability that we have, uh, sorry, twice, we have a zero 
column are a zero row. So the probability that a random Bernoulli matrix is singular is the probability that it has a zero row column plus something much smaller. So the main reason for singularity of such Bernoulli matrices is the presence of zero row or column. Both theorems are proved geometrically and actually the proof is mostly on the blackboard. So uh, it follows exactly this roadmap. The only thing we have to take care of is this part, the implementation of one and two. And let me talk about this implementation. Instead of uh, doing it in two steps, characterizing M and uh, then proving that uh, the random normal do doesn't fall into this set with uh, this characterization, Tikhomirov uh, takes a radically different route. Uh, he do, does it in one strike. By the way, I talked about characterization for Bernoulli's. We had cosines, but it turns out that the same arithmetic nature is responsible for uh, the bad behavior in all cases, regardless of the nature of entries. Yet for Bernoulli entries, you can do better. So what is the idea? Let's take, <coughs> and delta, the sphere, D, uh, delta, net with, uh, without any connection to this set M and so far I, uh, and let you, uh, let's say V be a random, vector uniformly distributed in N delta. And then we aim to prove that for any M, and I will leave here as a space, the probability, sorry, uh, for any M, the cardinality of the bad set intersected with this net is exponentially small. Compared to the cardinality of the net. Again, uh, you uh, we want to repair the epsilon net argument and we need an exponential factor. If I can get this exponential factor, I am done immediately. So I want to be able to choose this M capital. Of course, if I write it like this, it's meaningless because I can take M uh, to infinity and it, uh, it would mean that uh, this set is empty, which we, we know it is not. So what, uh, uh, what is really proved is that for any M there exists an N, N zero such that for any N greater than N zero that happens. So this is a deterministic statement. But this statement is amenable to probabilistic interpretation. Uh, 
Uh, I'm sorry, I, I ran in front of myself. So let's uh, translate it uh, probabilistically. Let's introduce a random vector uniformly distributed in this net. How do I interpret this? If I call it one, then one is equivalent to the probability with respect to V that V belongs to M is exponentially small. And this is what Tihomirov actually proves. Okay, how now how to do it? First of all, we spoke about delta nets and we didn't care how these delta nets were created. Let's choose a special delta net. And uh, uh, to do it first, I'll consider only typical points in the sphere. So we'll consider you in the sphere such that the maximum now coordinate is less or equal to say 1000 over square root of n. We know that uh, some coordinates can be larger than this, but there are only a few of these coordinates and these, uh, these uh, few coordinates can be taken care of separately. So the whole action occurs in this set which means that u belongs to the uh, scaled cube. Qn is, uh, is the unit cube. Okay, and then let's choose the number n and We will choose an, uh, a net in this cube this big net to be uh, one over n square root of n u. Ah, uh, sorry, Z, and intersected with this cube. Okay, uh, since n is in my power, uh, this multiplying by square root of n doesn't make much, uh, much sense. But it's, uh, we'll see in a moment that it is convenient for computations. Okay. So, is one solving you can make it uh, No, this is an absolute constant. Uh, we'll have to take care about the, of them separa uh, separately. Most of the coordinates will still be of this order. So there are few other coordinates and we'll have to create the, the additional net for these few coordinates, but because the coordinates are so, we have only a few coordinates. I, Actually, we will we'll modify this process for large coordinates. Now we are, we do it the same, the same process for uh, for all coordinates. Only uh, for large coordinates, we uh, we consider not uh, uh, this, but uh, the intervals from one thousand square root of n to two thousand square root of n two thousand two. Yeah. 
but I, I, I want to skip this technicality because it, uh, it only complicates the case and the real action is in the queue. So, uh, why is this net different from all other nets? The reason uh, why we chose the, uh, the integer points is that it's very easy to generate a random vector uniformly distributed in this set. The coordinates are uh, scaled integers. So if I rescale it back and let's change this, let's introduce a scaling and let's consider and that and delta tilde, which is uh, the scaled copy, which is Zn intersected with uh, thousand and un. So this is a part of the integer lattice inside a cube. A random vector distributed in, in this discrete cube has independent co coordinates, which are uniformly distributed. The J is uniformly distributed in negative 1000 and 1000. And in, the, in these integer points, which is a very easy random variable, it's, uh, it's pretty easy to handle. Moreover, uh, there is another advantage in this special net. This, uh, 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 this net uh, is integer and the entries in both cases, the entries of the random matrix is all, uh, also integer. So the linear combination is going to be distributed also over integers, which is much easier to handle. And now, we want to show that the probability so the probability that v is in M is bounded by e to the negative mn. And we, don't, we want to do it obliviously without characterizing the set M. So what is the set M by definition? It's of this, so, Here, this is uh, a point belongs to this set M means that the probability with respect to random variables say uh, psi one psi n of the sum j from one to n u j psi j 
less than epsilon is greater or equal than C epsilon. For a technical reason to carry out the proof, we, we don't need, we need slightly more than this small ball probability. We need to consider all possible shifts of this. Uh, and this should be for any given x in r. Uh, sorry, for uh, if uh, if I it's greater for some some x in r. So, in other words, I need to put here the supremum over x in r. Okay, and after we have done it, we see that this is a familiar function. It's, uh, it's well known in probability. This, is, this object, the supremum over x in r of the absolute, uh, of the probability that a random variable y minus x is less than epsilon is uh, called the Levy concentration function. And so my uh, space, uh, my set, uh, my, uh, uh, my set M is described by the condition that the uh, the Levy concentration function of this sum and epsilon greater or equal than C epsilon for some epsilon greater for then exponentially small quantum. And then uh, a very short argument shows uh, that it's enough to consider only one concrete, not this, sorry one minus p plus delta one half plus delta to the power n, n if we are aiming at Tihomirov's theorem. So slightly more than one half. And uh, a very simple consideration shows that it's enough to check it not for all epsilons, but for the extreme case. So instead of epsilon greater or equal, I can write epsilon equal to this. And this is the description of my M. That the Levy, con Levy concentration function with respect to these random variables psi is uh, going to behave pathologically. Okay. Now, how it is uh, related to our N capital and to our special net, we will choose a special value for M. one minus P plus Delta, one minus P, one half plus Delta to the power negative M. And this will be a complete description of our net. And then the main theorem of uh, 
Tihomirov is the following. Let's. Let this M tilde say is there a scaled net Z and intersected with whatever we have there. Present M Q M. Where n capital is this. Let V be a random vector uniformly distributed in M tilde. Again, this is uh, the, a very easy vector to describe. Its coordinates are uniform on negative 1000 and 1000 then and independent then for any m uh, the probability and here we have to be accurate the probability with respect to this vector v of uh, the pathological behavior, the pathological behavior is that the Levy uh, concentration function with respect to psi of some j from one to n uh, v j psi j and uh, Square root of n n is greater than second l over n is less or equal than exponential to the negative cm. I'll explain the numerology here in a minute. So, first of all, what, uh, what does it say? Uh, this, if I take a random vector in this stead, then the probability that the Levy concentration function is abnormally large is uh, exponentially small uh, m n exponentially small in n with any m of course with any m should be understood in the sense i already talked about for any m there exists n zero of m such that for all n greater than n zero this holds now why is this square root of n here and why uh, why is uh, this uh, l over n here the square root is inherited from the fact that we are considering this cube one over square root of n. If you rescale it, you'll get this square root. Now, what about L over n? Uh, 
it will take me another minute to explain it. Let's fix, uh, let's fix Xi. So, and then an elementary probabilistic inequality shows that uh, the probability that the probability that uh, some v j psi j minus x for any real x is less than square root of n is going to be less or equal than c over m. For any x. And the probability is taken with respect to this random vector v. This is, uh, can be done in thousands of different ways. For example, Berriesen theorem will do it. So this is the Levy concentration function, and it is bounded by a constant times n. So it almost looks that we don't have to do anything. This is for all psi. Actually, we have to do work, and this is a hard work. Uh, because if it, it is for all psi, I can put the expectation with respect to psi in prime. And then I'll have the product probability. And from Markov's inequality, I'll have uh, here any constant. We need to improve this constant to the exponentially small level. And this is what Tihomirov did. The uh, very surprising thing in this proof is that uh, unlike what we did before with Fourier transform and analyzing it, this is done by the elementary means uh, using high school mathematics. This is due to the fact that the random uh, vector v is so easy. It's, uh, it's just uh, the uniform distribution on integer numbers. Oh, uh, I, I consider uh, plus minus ones. If psi, uh, some entries of psi are zero, I will say that, for example, at least one, uh, one over 1,000 uh, of these entries are, are one. Uh, oh, th this is the, the crucial thing. So let's, uh, let's look at this. I can choose any M and uh, the only thing I have to adjust is the, st uh, the starting point where this inequality kicks off. Very surprisingly, this N L is going to be independent of M. And this is the hardest point of the proof. And since I ran out of time, let me. Stop at this point.